My name is Janet Dietrich. I uh, am delighted to be here. I work in our Commodities and Global Markets Division. Uh, I'm based in Houston, Texas. Um, I help lead our businesses globally around the energy transition you know, as we're moving our underlying, underlying and existing businesses and moving into adjacencies that the transition brings. And we work alongside our clients with the opportunities that the, that the transition brings. I am delighted, as I said, to um, participate in our dialogue today in our panel around building the partnerships that deliver the energy transition. And we're going to tease out, or we hope to tease out, um, three different themes. The first one's going to be around the role of partnerships in decarbonizing the electric grid, transportation, and specifically the aviation sector, and then also an in industry around carbon removal. The second theme uh, we plan to tease out is going to be around leveraging long-term partnerships to hopefully remain, remain competitive and overcoming the challenges that we see out there. And the third thing is going to be the importance around the policy frameworks that underpin all of this. Uh, and so with that, if you will join me in welcoming our panelists to the stage. And I know many people probably know already your businesses and who each of you are, but I'm going to take a shot at um, summarizing and introducing each of you. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the CVs were very long, so I'm sure this is not <laughs> going to get to it all. Uh, we have Cordy O'Hara. Cordy is the president of National Grid Ventures, and as I understand, is soon to be uh, leading the National Grid's electricity distribution uh, area. I think that's going to be in April or May, as I understand. That's right. In your current role, you're responsible for the development, financing, construction, and operation of large-scale energy assets. Um, she began her career actually where I do. We have something in common around trading uh, power and gas at Centrica operations, etc. You were, uh, importantly, the director of the UK system operator here in Great Britain. Uh, and prior to joining uh, National Grid Ventures, you were the COO, lived in the U.S., I understand, of their, their gas distribution business. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. We have Philippe LeCamp, uh, the CEO of Sky Energy. Uh, I know Philippe and I could sit here and talk for hours, uh, as we did a few minutes ago before this, uh, around um, the aviation sector and sustainable aviation fuels. Um, Philippe has a long-standing career in the aviation space, spending over 30 years with the Swire Group, and I think the majority of that uh, were in senior management positions with Cathay Pacific Airways, most recently as the Chief Risk Officer. Um, prior to Swire, uh, Philippe held senior positions around bioenergy and came to Sky Energy in 2021, and you've been a real leader in the important area of sustainable aviation fuel, which we will tease out in a minute. And then, of course, our partner, Nick Cooper, with, uh, with Sturega. Um, uh, Nick has been the CEO of Sturega since 2019, has spent much of your career uh, in the international upstream oil and gas um, uh, sector, as well as corporate finance. Prior to Sturega, you were CEO, I understand, of Ofer Energy, if I said that right, and then, of course, the CFO at Salamander uh, Energy. You were a member of the energy and power team at Goldman Sachs, and importantly, started uh, as a geophysicist by trade. I think. So welcome. Uh, we have a lot of content that we're going to cover here, I have no doubt. And Cordy, we're going to start with you. So, uh, and, and thank you, Albert, for ending on this uh, important area as well. Electrification, renewables, and the grid. Uh, we were talking about it earlier. You guys are really at the heart of, of, of this transition. You know, you're, you're, sort of, you're sort of the anchor. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about National Grid, National Grid Ventures, and kind of what you're doing in this space as a whole. Yeah, well, thank you, and it's a real pleasure to be here with my esteemed panelists. Um, of course, National Grid's one of the largest investor-owned utilities in the world, um, and we've got our core operations here in the UK and also in the northeast of the US. We are the owner-operator of the England and Wales transmission uh, network, as well as now uh, an owner and operator of a quarter of the country's electricity distribution networks as well. And in the US, we're an integrated utility, so gas and electric networks in both New York and Massachusetts. And that makes up about 90% of our business. So our core is big infrastructure, big motorways of energy, connecting um, electricity and gas from where it's produced to where it's consumed. Uh, the business I've been running for the last two years is National Grid Ventures, and that's our commercial arm. Um, that's where we look at um, additional adjacent energy asset classes that help facilitate the energy transition. And that's a portfolio of businesses. Here in the UK, we've got the largest uh, liquefied natural gas terminal in Europe, and that can supply up to 25% of the UK's 
peak demand for gas on a winterly day, so very, very critical asset uh, this winter, as well as a growing portfolio of interconnectors, so big motorways of energy between countries, and, and we're connected to five, and we're building our sixth right now, and, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about those. And then in the US, um, we have a broader set of activities, including uh, generation activities, both traditional generation on Long Island, as well as onshore renewables uh, in the Midwest, and now a very important strategic partnership with RWE for offshore wind in the New York Bight. So we are at the heart of the energy transition. Uh, we see uh, the role of grids as critically important to enable clean energy transition, as well as understanding the criticality of reliability and affordability. And of course, our final role is as the system operator here in the UK. Uh, you brought up interconnectors. I'd love to go into that a bit because I didn't, you know, I, I understood a bit country to country what you guys had been doing. Um, the interconnectors. Talk a little bit about, you know, especially the five that are in service. And I saw the video a couple of weeks ago on, I, I told you about that, the North yes. Sea Link, Absolutely. and just the, um, the, uh, just the preparation that goes into that and what that's all about. Uh, it's, it's just a, a magnitude uh, of a project. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I'm very proud. I'm not allowed to have a favorite, but of course, the Norwegian link, the North Sea link, is the longest subsea electricity interconnected cable in the world, 450 miles, uh, linking Kvildal in, in Norway to Blythe here in the UK. Thank you for talking in miles versus uh, kilometers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 752, uh, for those who want the conversion. Um, and of course, it's enough electricity to power 1.4 million homes. And that's alongside, um, we've got a total installed capacity at the moment of 6.4 gigawatts, two interconnectors to France, one to Belgium, one to the Netherlands, and now Viking, the Danish link, is, um, is more than halfway through its construction phase. And when it goes live at the end of this year, there'll be a total of eight, eight gigawatts of capacity. And of course, you know, massive feats of engineering to uh, deliver, uh, you know, high voltage direct current cables um, across, uh, you know, waters, um, conversion from um, from direct current to alternating current and then into into the sort of system operation that delivers ultimately those power to people's homes um, a really critical feature for us this winter in terms of security of supply um, and Catherine talked about the operation of markets in in her opening remarks and of course these are big motorways of energy that connect uh, flexible resources between countries and have brought about really in, tremendous water, isn't it? Uh, benefits. Yeah. So if you look at the start of this winter with Norway's depleted hydro reserves, which have luckily recovered uh, a lot of export from the UK to Norway. And then, of course, when the wind um, sometimes doesn't blow for us, uh, lots of imports into the UK. So a highly flexible toolkit mm -hmm. um, that accesses multiple markets and low carbon resources for the UK. Um, and, and the flows are going both ways, I understand. That's right. Start out one way, market Highly changed, flexible. Yes. Very flexible. Um, you brought up energy security. Uh, and, 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 you know, when we're thinking about that, um, with the war in Ukraine and, you know, kind of the, the, the real focus on energy security, when you think about natural gas and hydrocarbons and, and you know, kind of the re renewable sector, how do you guys think about the balance there? Yeah. You know, between fossil fuels and hydrocarbons and moving into renewables. Yeah, I think Albert talked well about, you know, the, f the focus has been on decarbonisation, but of course with the Russia-Ukraine crisis and then the cost of living concerns that, we, that are very, very real, um, that has brought uh, affordability and energy sovereignty right to the top of the political agenda. And a lot of practical decisions have had to be made in the short term to reduce the reliance on Russian gas. And tremendous cooperation has actually happened across the UK um, and Europe to facilitate that. Uh, you know, and as I said before, I'm really proud of the role that the grid has played its part in facilitating that. In the longer term, I think, you know, through the British Energy Security Strategy, through Repower EU, the long term affordable, clean solution is large volumes of renewable resources. And so the task at hand now is to move from the ambition into the execution mm -hmm. of enabling um, 50 gigawatts for the UK offshore wind by 2030. And if you add the EU targets, 125 gigawatts. Mm -hmm. So the criticality then of the enabling grid and the role that we can play to facilitate that really comes into the fore for National Grid.
Yep, and I'd love to tease that out a little bit more, but why don't we pause for a second, and Philippe, let's move on, let's move on to, on to you. So, um, the aviation sector, um, we talked about this in my opinion and, and a few others, it could be our largest decarbonization challenge that we have, I think. And I have to throw out a couple stats here to get you to respond to that, and then, and then uh, I'll, 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 I'll let you kind of, kind of run with it. So the consensus is that jet fuel consumption is projected to rise significantly. I think we were talking about this. Something like 75% of the world's population has never been on a plane. Um, so the growth factor there, I don't think anyone is questioning. But the interesting stats to me are the jet fuel market today, I think this is an EIO forecast and BNF probably has this out, is somewhere around 6.9 to 7 million barrels a day of jet fuel consumption. So that's what we use today. The forecast from the EIA, the demand forecast by 2050, takes that 6.9 million barrels of jet fuel today to 15 million barrels. And if you believe, I think the, uh, the aviation sector organization, IATA, um, uh, has come out with their net zero study on how, how the aviation sector is going to get to, to net zero. They, they believe that 65% of that reduction is going to come from sustainable aviation fuel. And so if you do the molecule math, and if I have it right, we're going to need 10 million barrels of sustainable aviation fuel by 2050. And I believe we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000, maybe 10,000 barrels a day of sustainable aviation fuel being produced. So how are we going to get there? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's tiny. It was, it was quite revealing. It, it didn't feature in Albert's projections at all. It's definitely the hardest to abate uh, user of liquid fuel. Um, how do we do it? I mean, hearing about the challenges to the grid, you know, I mean, like, renewable electricity being a key feedstock, ultimately, for the production of certain fuels. Um, to put it in, in you know, other numbers, we, we're looking at 750 facilities. So if we think about... SAF today being, you know, nascent technology, we're looking about a sort of 100,000 ton, 30 million gallon type facilities. We're looking at 750 or more of those to reach just the US and the EU targets. To get to net zero by 2050, we're looking at 2,500 plus. There are 27 years to go to build 25,000 facilities. So clearly the challenge is enormous. Uh, the capital required for that is enormous. And perhaps I should back up a little bit and explain what, who Sky Energy is and, and what we're trying to do. Please. Uh, Sky Energy came out, actually, of uh, a sustainability study with KLM. It was spun out in 2009. shows you it really is quite nascent. And they've been at the forefront of the development of the market, education, demand creation, working with airlines to help prove flights, sourcing, blending, certification... Um, to try and generate this awareness of what SAF was in, in a totally voluntary market because they recognised very early on that this was you know, absolutely critical to be reaching uh, the reduction that is, was going to be required from this very difficult to abate industry. First of a, first of a kind opportunities, you know, they, they did the first commercial flight, they did the first corporate programme. And this is a really interesting point because what we're seeing amongst corporates is a willingness to pay. You'll often hear in the, in the SAF market, well, you know, you, you can't possibly have fuel that's going to be two, three, four, five, ten times what fossil fuel is today. And that kind of misses the point. Aviation has to decarbonize. It also has to defossilize. That means we're moving away from fossil fuel. So to use that as a benchmark price is very misleading. And I think I sort of summarize that all by saying there is going to be pressure on prices, there's going to be an increase in tickets, there could be pressure on us all in the amount that we fly, if we're going to get anywhere close to reaching the targets for, for 2050. Maybe we'll even back up, why don't you give us just a, a simple definition of what is sustainable aviation fuel, where does it come from? Maybe take us through that just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, we do tend to sort of jump into, well, <laughs> we everybody, jump everybody understands what SAF is. Uh, Waste-based fuel, so, you know, looking, if, if you think today, uh, renewable diesel is, is probably the best known. There, there's a technology that takes waste oils and turns that into, into liquid fuels. Great. The most proven technology uh, out there, a challenge on the feedstock. And for those of you who track, you know, UK prices, used cooking oil, uh, you know, that's trading at multiples of, of fossil fuel um, today. So we can already see there's going to be a challenge in that particular feedstock. So what do we need to look at? We need to look at other feedstocks that are scalable, financeable and available. Mm -hmm. And so we look at alcohol to jet pathways where we take ethanols, so producing from 
waste forest residues, agricultural residues, those kinds of things. Renewable natural gas is what we call a cellulosic pathway, and that can move into things like alcohol to jet. And then the sort of holy grail, uh, which is where we look at electricity, renewable electricity, uh, and I think the technical term for this is magic, where you take a renewable electricity, as far as I can understand it, and you convert that through electrolyzers, you convert that into liquid fuel. Fantastic, infinite, potentially very challenging, very expensive today. And you talked about alcohol to jet and, and probably alluding to the power to liquids. Um, but now we're, we're sort of back in the, in the near term, fats, oil, greases. That's, what, that's what's being... Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the, the challenge uh, is, is financing, right? I mean, we look at one of these facilities, and you're looking at seven or 800 million euros, dollars, pounds, whichever way you want to look at it. Very significant capital is going to be required. Um, so, yeah, the challenge is real. And, and you, we need partners to step up and help finance that. And as we saw with ICC as an example, where GIG is, is, uh, is, is helping you know, really bring an extremely important, critical part of sustainable aviation fuel is green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, so that input, and, and of course, I mean, Nick, I'm sure we'll talk to that as well, uh, really essential that we work out how do you take that and you scale it sufficiently so that it is a, a financeable uh, input into what is essential in terms of the feedstock for sustainable aviation fuel. So you talked about corporates um, being willing to step up and pay. Yep. Um, I think we were chatting earlier. Um, I happened to be on the, coincidentally on a call with one of the, the larger airlines just a couple of days ago, and one of the things that was brought out from them was just the, 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 fact, the fact that uh, sustainable aviation fuel needed to be at cost parity with jet fuel in order for them to really consider you know, longer-term um, contracts. I mean, uh, SAP yeah. right now is two to four yeah. to five sure. to plus times sure. jet, right? Yeah, and I, I'm a former aviation guy, so, you know, so I used to so it has to be at parity. Of course it doesn't. You know, it's, it's, it's the wrong metric now to be looking at. It's not about parity. How do you factor in the cost of carbon if, you, if you're going to have a fossil jet? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ultimately, we're going to see that pressure come on this industry in some form. So uh, with due respect to that large U.S. carrier, I would suggest that... Uh, I didn't say U.S. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, it's a challenge. I understand yeah. the principle, but ultimately the reality is that as we move through this decarbonisation process, uh, you know, cost, cost will have to, to rise to, to cover that. There will be an element of pass-through, of course, but, but clearly, you know, margins in aviation are thin, and uh, people are very conscious of that. And one other thing that was brought out was just uh, the, the need for consistency in the end product of, of SAF. And right now, n not sure how, where do we sit on the spectrum of consistency? Because I think the thought is, you know, SAF, it's got to, if it touches one engine, it has to be able to touch every engine in the same manner for it to really be scalable. Yeah, and you touched on a really important point, which again, I, I, I skirted over and I shouldn't have done. The, the beauty of SAF, that 65% that you talked about in terms of, 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 of mm -hmm. finding our way to net zero in 2050, um, you know, that, that is, uh, it's, a, it's a drop in fuel is the best way to describe it. So you think of two glasses drop of water, you can, you, can just, you can just mix the two together. You don't need to change the infrastructure. You don't need to change the technology. It's usable today. And that, of course, is the critical part of this mm -hmm. solution. We will see arguments around new propulsion technologies. We'll see efficiencies in the, in the airline industry. We're going to continue to see offsets, I'm sure, as part of the mix. But that huge chunk has to come from sustainable aviation fuel, and it can be done today. Yeah, and I think on that, six, uh, the, the, uh, the way that they put it together, 65% of the reductions would come from sustainable aviation yep. fuel, 13% from new technologies, 3% um, from efficiencies and that sort of thing. But 11%, they think, will still come from offsets because they just don't see the decarbonization math working in aviation you know, without that. Yeah, and I mean, the challenge around new propulsion technologies is, I mean, as anybody here who's you know, looked, looked at this understands, in aviation, we, we've got the next generation of aircraft arriving today. That's an asset lifetime of 20 years. Hydrogen planes are not going to be here in 20 years. Um, it's going to be a, a very challenging process to bring that kind of technology online with all the infrastructure changes that are going to be required. So SAF, drop in fuel, available today. We've got to work out how to finance these, these, these projects. These are first of their kind uh, as we start. And again, that's why Sky Energy is focused on the cellulosic and the, and the power to liquid pathways as one of the three technologies we're working on for our facilities in the pipeline today. 
because we recognize you know, we can do the, the waste oils are good to 2025, into the late 20s, but by then we've got to have mm -hmm. uh, these other feedstock technologies in place. And maybe one more just quick question and then, and then we'll, we'll pause here. Um, so going to Sky Energy and sort of your business model, you guys have evolved you know, over the last decade from um, sourcing to producing. So how did, you, how did you decide to sort of make that switch? Yeah, I mean, it's really a natural progression. So you know, when you start as, as the educator and the demand creator, and you realize that there isn't a lot of fuel around and they're, they're working, and, and we talk about partnerships, <laughs> they're in a collaboration with, with, with Shell as an example, really essential. Mm -hmm. And I think actually Mel Lane's here today, you know, really important collaboration part, teaming agreement with Boeing, same thing, very important mm -hmm. um, part, of, part of that that particular puzzle. Yep, terrific. All right, so let's change, gear, change gears a little bit and Nick, move over to you. So Storega, your sole focus, I think, has been really on net zero infrastructure, but particularly, at least initially, around carbon capture and storage and, and basically the value chain that that facilitates. Um, it's really had its struggles in the past, um, not Storega, but carbon capture. Yeah. Um, and especially over the last decade, last couple decades probably, it just really hadn't got the momentum that it seems like it might be getting now. Maybe talk us through that a little bit and how Storega sort of fits in the picture there. Yeah, so let's do CCS first. and. To see everybody. Um, so uh, think of CCS as a reverse carbon cycle. It's reverse oil and gas. It's as simple as that. And I'd say on the risk spectrum, it's a, at the lower end of the risk spectrum for what the oil and gas industry currently does at the moment. It's not risk free, but it's a, it's a relatively low risk reverse carbon cycle. Um, it's about 25 years behind where it should be in terms of rollout. If you look at the IEA numbers, and they're pretty much on consensus, most people follow them. Um, and compare where we need to be in 2050 for the 2.0 degrees path, not even the 1.5, and look at where we are now. We are massively behind the ball. Um, today, there are 26 operational or near imminently operating uh, CCS projects around the world, and they are storing about 40 million tons. They need to scale to six gigatons by 2050, and they need, that means, depending on the size of the project, between two and 3,000 equivalent projects with multiple users, i.e. multiple emitters, getting their CO2 into the ground. That is the equivalent. Now, on, on Albert's charts, CCS was a, I saw, a I was very looking, tiny slither in there actually. relative to the money that's going into EV. And, the, and this is not an instead of anything. This is an, this is a, a, these are additional tools that need to be laid alongside everything else that we've talked about today and will get talked about, and they are massively behind the ball. It's not complicated. There's various reasons why it is behind the ball, uh, partly because the skill set sat in an industry that was very busy with its day job and wasn't mm -hmm. induced to focus on it, which is oil and gas. Um, and um, we've got to play catch up really quickly. We have got 27 years, less than that now. And to get to six gigatons, it's not far off the equivalent of building out in 27 years the entire scale of the current international oil and gas industry. Yes, I saw. That took 120 years to get to that scale. We need a reverse carbon industry almost akin to the oil and gas industry today to get to 2.0. That's scary fact one. Scary fact two, and I promise it's my last one, is one of the derivative technologies of CCS is direct air capture. Horribly expensive at the moment, got to come down the cost curve and we can talk about that if you're interested. But the sad fact is that as great as nature-based solutions are, and I'm as big a fan as anybody in this room, I live on a farm, we're planting 10,000 trees, so it's not an either-or situation. But if you look at the real numbers, IEA and others, unfortunately, on a finite planet, even if we optimize soil, peat bogs, forestry, oceans, you name it, we can only get at best halfway there in terms of getting carbon back safely out of harm's way. Only halfway there. We need to have an engineered solution to sit alongside the uh, nature-based solutions, and it needs to be just as big again, and it hasn't even started yet, and we've got 27 years. That's DAC. There you go. So why don't you back up and take us through that, that sort of chain, that carbon yeah. change. And, you, know, you start with you know, capture, storage, utilization, yeah. you know, the whole chain there, and then we'll, we'll, we'll tease out back a bit. Yeah, so it, it is important to think about the jigsaw puzzle. It's not that complicated, but people do tend to, you tend to see technology companies picking one bit and sort of describing it that's as if it's all of it. It's, it's not. Um, it's an integrated value chain, very much like LNG or any gas value chain would be, but in reverse. Um, it is a waste management value chain. It's lower margin than oil and gas through the cycle, and that is really important to make this work. It needs to be cost effective for, for customers, which is emitters both with chimneys and without. Um, but the way to think about it is 
in three components. There's where the CO2 comes from. There's then how you get the CO2 from where it came from to the store, and then there's a storing bit. So just quickly on those three bits, if I may, and there's a cost stack, there's a cost equivalent with each of those three activities. The CO2 comes from generically four areas. It's capturing CO2 that's going up chimneys, so industrial and power. It's the manufacture of blue hydrogen, and it's two engineered removal areas, one of which is bioenergy into CCS, so like what Drax is doing here, and the other which is direct air capture. There are four generic areas where CO2 comes from en masse. You then need to move it from those point of captures, so there's a capture cost, there's a transportation cost, a midstream bit, and then there's a storage bit. It's a storage cost. Now, most of the storage is going to be offshore. Think of them as waste disposal sites for multiple emitters. It's not that much more complicated than that. But it's the cost stack of capture, transport, storage that you need to think about and then compare how that quantifies to either the tax incentives or the carbon price in a particular geography. Now, on the transport or, or shipping piece, that's kind of there already. That's kind of already happening. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's not hard to move CO2 yes, around. It's right. just an industrial right. gas. It's not complicated. Right. Yeah. Um, the cost of these projects, these mm. are really high-dollar projects. Yeah. It, it, they, they are quite pricey. The best way to think about it, though, is really on a dollar per ton basis, if we can. Um, so my rule of thumb is if you're looking at a, 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 a total co all-in cost of capture, transport, and store for CCS of between $80 and $140 a ton, that will get most emitters actively thinking, I'm better off to store my CO2 than to emit. Mm -hmm. That's regardless of whether they're in the US with the 45Q or whether they're in the EU with the ETS or UK with the ETS. If you look yesterday, for example, the EU ETS went through, 100, ah, let's say $100 yesterday, was it 100 euros. Um, so it's already at the bottom end of that range. This kit needs to be built, so people, if you're an emitter sitting you know, uh, in Europe now, you are looking forward over a three, four year build cycle at the carbon forecast then. And most people have got a carbon forecast that's healthily in that 80 to 140 range. So there is an element of government support and, and facilitation, but this is largely becoming a commercial activity right here, right now. And certainly over the next three to four years, I initially believe the carbon price is going to crash. Um, geography, you know, yeah. when you're looking at geography, whether it's over here and how Starega has been looking at it here in the UK and in Europe, yeah. in the US, um, geology is important? Uh, geology is really important, but, but if you think about where you're going to be active, the three criteria are where is there sufficient storage geology? Well, actually, secrets out, it's, there's a lot of storage geology. It's concentrated in certain countries, but there's more than enough to get this done. Mm -hmm. The UK and Norway have probably 90% of Europe's total, which is a bit of a geographic anomaly, a geological anomaly, but that could be solved for. Um, where are there enough emissions? Well, sadly, there's a lot of emissions, um, but in terms of cheap to capture, they are, tend to be concentrated in big industrial areas. Fine, you twin the two together. You've then got where does the government want to get stuff done? Mm -hmm. And sadly, the paces are very variable around the world. Um, even in the last 18 months, we've seen in our business alone a complete reversal of pace. Um, 18 months ago on the back of, well, 15 months ago on the back of COP26 in Glasgow, UK, our home market was going flat out. We were in top gear, doing CCS, hydrogen, direct air capture, our three main business lines. Mm -hmm. Since then, the UK has, if we take Albert's diagram, has probably dropped the baton. Um, the US, of course, has accelerated. Thankfully, we had, a head, we had a bridgehead in the States before the IRA, but we are now flat out in the US. Mm -hmm. Canada's coming online very quickly. We've got Australian businesses in our office today, Singapore, Malaysia. It, it's all starting there are bright spots there are a lot of areas of the world where people aren't thinking about it yet we have to be careful it's largely still an oecd thing at the moment but boy the sucking sound in the states is very high at the moment yep yeah but it definitely feels like we've moved into to action much much more yeah. you, you did touch on direct air capture or dac and that's um it feels so nascent to me mm -hmm. however we are hearing about it more and more and more and even with the airlines on my call the other day on the airlines, you know, you're looking at it. You've got, if I remember correctly, you've got the join the dots sort of way yeah. of thinking. Um, you want to tease that out a little bit? Well, yeah, I, mean, I defer to greater brains than mine around, around this group, but, but I think, um, you know, there's, there's various people talking about electric up to a certain range of 1,000 kilometers, two kilometers. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Hydrogen, if it, as and when the fleet gets renewed, 20 years' time. But then you've got sustainable aviation fuel as well to fill the gap. And, you know, it's, it's the building blocks to get to that. You know, really to sustainable aviation fuel, the best way to do it, if you can afford it and get the costs down and the inputs, is green hydrogen and CO2 captured, either going up a chimney or from the atmosphere and pulled down. Now, none of this stuff is particularly complicated, 
it's just manufacturing at scale. We drove solar and wind down that cost curve down quickly. We need to do the same with right. electrolyzers for green hydrogen and with the AC kit. Um, I have to ask you this question because being a girl from Kentucky, we're known as the bourbon state. And <laughs> I know that you're working with the distillers in Scotland around yeah. uh, uh, the, uh, the carbon neutral um, whiskey. Um, can you take us through sort of that, um, uh, I think you call it the Scottish cluster? Yeah, so, so um, I guess I've, so I should say, Sturega, we do three things. We do CCS, we do hydrogen blue and green, and we do direct air capture. So, so the Scottish cluster is a big multi-user CCS project with, with all the bits that you'd expect to see to go into one of those. And um, uh, you know, we've got an excellent partner group there, including sort of illustrious names, better known names than us, say Shell, Exxon, Ineos, SS, SSC, et cetera. Um, what we're doing in green hydrogen um, is we're working with Scottish Power and others to, to develop green hydrogen projects. And, and green hydrogen, you know, it's to, to the point we made before, you know, substitution from one fuel to another takes decades, unless there's some external shock to the system. You know, whether it's coal to, charcoal to coal, coal to oil, oil to gas, you look back, it takes 20, 30 years for each one of these to, 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 to happen naturally. So we've really got to turbocharge it. Green hydrogen is exactly the same as is hydrogen generally, which, you know, although we're in it, has been historically overhyped in the last five years. It's got a great place, but it's not panacea for everything. And it's partly the substitution effect. The, the question is, how quickly can you see the demand ramp up? Mm -hmm. The great thing about distilleries in Scotland is that, I wouldn't say they're price insensitive, but the input cost for energy is only a relatively small part of their cost structure. And so the benefit in terms of having differentiated products that are truly net zero um, outweigh the, um, the, the input costs in, in, in that higher margin business. Um, and so, yeah, we, it's a popular field trip, but we're, you know, we'll be building yeah, probably like UK's that. first um, <laughs> operational green uh, hydrogen project, and it'll be the, the, the distilleries are amongst the early customers. And you're talking about green hydrogen, uh, and maybe we'll go into partnerships just a little bit. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll kick it over to you, um, the, the high cc mm. uh, partnership that, that we all are, are involved with together. Um, green hydrogen is, you know, obviously a key there. Yep. Maybe chat a little bit about how you guys are looking at leveraging off of that project into uh, the SAP world. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's as you said, it's it's an essential feedstock. Um, I think we, we, you know, there are some slightly outlandish prices, uh, low prices that are being thrown around a, a little bit. I think is a sort of expectation management piece that that needs to take place, and Nick's alluded to that. Uh, ICC, you know, a critical part of the, the project that, that uh, Sky Energy is developing in. In Del Cell, which is a, is, is a waste oil, it's a it's a differentiated strategy. Actually, uh, sustainability criteria are really really key for the positioning of Sky Energy. So, um, so in, fa in fact, as an aside, we have uh, we're RSB certified. That's the roundtable for renewable um, biomass, uh, biomaterials rather, um, as part of that. So, you know, the, the green hydrogen component is, is is really critical for us, and it's proving it out. Um, and obviously, what we then hope is that. As we're able to be the off-taker for ICC and as KLM are the off-taker for the fuel that comes out, now that allows these projects to be de-risked to a degree to enable them to be financeable because ultimately all of this comes back to being uh, finding people who are able to de-risk the partners who can help you de-risk the, 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 right. around the entire ecosystem right. and allow that then to be financeable. Right. And um, maybe just thinking about green hydrogen and, and from a partnership standpoint, I have to ask about the vision to 2050 and the the multi-purpose interconnectors that you, the the national grid is sort of moving towards. Can yeah. you talk about you know kind of your vision there and and be sure to bring in the energy island and, and how you're going to incorporate. Yeah. <laughs> How no, is part of that? Absolutely. I mean, it was great to, I mean, there's, there's technology partners, um, there's international collaborations, there's new partnerships with complementary capabilities, and, and that's really where multipurpose interconnectors come into play. So I talked to you earlier about interconnectors, which are really point to point. You know, they're an energy, uh, a, a source of energy channel, a HVDC link between two countries. Mm -hmm. um, but I also mentioned the criticality of accelerating, enabling the offshore wind targets which will reduce our dependency on Russian gas, localize our energy resources, and bring about some of the lowest cost electricity production on scale. Um, what multipurpose interconnectors do is create unique partnerships. We've already got great partners across the end of those interconnectors, the European transmission system operators who are joint venture partners. Um, but we've also envisaged that this infrastructure can be an accelerator enabler for offshore wind. Um, so multi-purpose interconnectors serve two key roles. They allow the transfer of electricity between two nations, mm -hmm. 
um, and they also allow and enable offshore wind connections. So we were very, very excited to um, participate in our recent regulatory process, which was with Ofgem, our UK regulator. They opened up their first window for pilot programs for these infrastructure deliveries, and we've had two selected, one to Belgium and one to the Netherlands. So we're now in um, you know, negotiations over the next six months that will define uh, the business models and regimes that could bring that infrastructure to life. Um, but the other dimension of partnerships is acknowledging, you know, we've got the, the North Seas and all of the continents surrounding it. Um, and I think, I'm, I think Giles is sitting just behind me, um, who's the CEO of Wind Europe, and I'm, I'm very proud to be part of his board. But partnerships um, need to be very extensive in their nature. You know, Giles is leading um, a 600-member organisation over 50 countries, looking at um, um, how we can accelerate wind resources, the supply chain, yeah. and um, back to execution, pace and scale, you know, really drive through and remove the blockers to what needs to be done in the time scale we've got. And just to put it in perspective, for National Grid, we've got to deliver about five times the amount of infrastructure we've delivered in, in the last 30 years, in the next seven years, to make yeah. this happen. Um, it's not a vision to 2050, it's a vision to 2030. <laughs> there's, there's a 2030 <laughs> vision and, of course, That's there's good. a 2050 vision. Right. Um, and so we will need collaborations and partnerships beyond all of our borders because to achieve the pace and scale, uh, we will need the critical sort of administrative unlocks that we might, that we see collectively across the board on permitry. We need the collective unlock on anticipatory investment for grids because that will be the enabler to get this power to, to shore. And then we need unique political partnerships um, where actually we look at the, the resources needed, the supply chain capacity build that's needed um, to, to unlock everything in front of us. So, you know, I was excited about the partnership aspect to this. Um, I think the, the countries are in, in competition, and rightly so. That will drive, drive, drive through cost and innovation. And at the same time, we've all got the same targets, the same goals, mm -hmm. and the collaboration and, um, across fuel types, countries, nations, nationally, locally, is, yep. is going to be part of the picture. Yep, no doubt. I think you call that the trilateral partnership sort of a, a, a thought there. Um, and is that, in, in thinking about that, and I know we're going to run out of time here in one or two minutes, two minutes, here we go. Um, I want to touch on policy and, you know, thinking about the partnerships and thinking about the good learnings that, that you guys have had. You're now in a partnership uh, over in the States on, on win with RWE, I think. Um, maybe just touch on policy real quick and, you know, kind of this whole race, potentially the race to the top with, we've talked about the US IRA, what the EU is doing. You know, how are you guys thinking about that as it relates? You've got operations, I think all of you uh, in the EU, uh, in the US. Um, maybe, maybe we'll start over here and just uh, close it out with a, a note on policy. Uh, on policy, well, I think an interest, it'd be interesting to see how the EU reacts um, and if the UK reacts at some point as well. But uh, in terms of the IRA, I think that, I think that a lot of people don't appreciate about it is it's a use it or lose it benefit. You know, it, certainly in our areas, you've got five plus seven years. And if you don't get in the game early, you lose some of those years of tax benefit. That's a heck of an enabler to get people to make decisions now, not in five years' time. That is tra that's not talked about very much, but that really gets people up and add a bit of American go for it type mentality as well to it. But it's mostly that use it or lose it window. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it'll be interesting if the, uh, the EU's response is similar. It's a little bit of the, the carrot and the stick, right? Yeah. Talking of which, uh, yeah, that's exactly what we see, the mandate side in Europe, which from an investor perspective, you can argue, fantastic. You know, binding legislation, 25 years, very clear what we've got to do, got to deliver. Challenging, probably means some imports for certain types of the, the, the sub mandates for certain types of fuels. Um, in the US, you know, stackable incentives in our world at the moment, eight bucks a gallon. Um, you know, so if we're looking at, let's say, 12 bucks probably for production, you're actually at that, what I said we shouldn't do, but that you're actually almost at parity with fossil fuels. So, again, great enabler. We probably need a bit of both in, in both, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's where we would hope that, um, mm. that, that manifests. Yeah, you can debate which one, which one do, you lean, do you lean towards, but you, you probably need both. You, you, yeah. yeah, we need it all. And anything from a policy standpoint relative to... Uh, how you guys have moved your business along. Yeah, I mean, I how think... How you plan to move it along. I think it's testament, you know, for the, the scale and pace at which we need to move, you can envisage important big policy unlocks to make that happen, whether that drives the technology innovation to move the cost down, 
to localize and, um, and diversify the supply chain. So there's lots of benefits from those mechanisms. Um, and so, you know, we've seen now the EU follow with, the, with their net zero industrial act. Um, and we need to keep the focus on the pace, the scale, um, the unlock. Um, and, um, you know, that, that's the critical role that these mechanisms play. And, and they're needed. Um, and they need to be optimized. And we just need to avoid unintended consequences with regards to um, the supply chain, which will be uh, the capacity, you know, needs to um, more than double to meet, meet these goals. I think that's a perfect way to maybe uh, end it here. Thank you all quite a bit. Uh, we appreciate it. We can, we can all agree. I think partnerships will be absolutely critical as we move forward.